We are starting a third day. Welcome, everybody. We welcome you to a new uh, day of LACNIC 40. Um, LACNOC 2023. I'm Carlos Martinez, Technology Director of LACNIC, and uh, this morning I'm going to be your Master of Ceremonies. Before we start with a panel that everybody's eager to hear, let me remind you that the LACNIC uh, booth is uh, in the trade show where you have different activities. You can leave your feedback on the different systems. We can talk about IPv6. RPKI, R&D, and other issues related to the projects and activities of LACNIC, and you have the complete agenda at the booth. So without further ado, this panel will be as follows. We are going to invite Jordi Palette, who's by our side. He's going to introduce uh, the topic, and uh, after that brief introduction, Jordi, please. After after Jordi, uh, we, I'm going to invite the rest of the panelists. Good morning, everyone. Let me give you a brief history of why we have this introduction. I suggested this panel four years ago, and then it took some time to get accepted because it's a very controversial. And finally, we have the no, they decided to organize the panel. I'm going to give a brief. Uh, um, I'm going to tell you what happened at APNIC. Uh, two slides, and I, so I suggested organizing this panel here. The APNIC uh, panel took place in Manila in APNIC 55. There you have the video and the website. Just in case uh, you're curious enough to read it, we invited several brokers. Unfortunately, only two of them confirmed their attendance in addition to an additional participant in the region. In this case, the panel took place uh, in the equivalent of our public policy forum, but they pointed out that it was not related with any proposal for any policy, so to avoid any uh, confusions, but obviously it has to do with policy. The staff uh, clarified and confirmed that at APNIC, uh, the current uh, uh, policy do not allow leasing, uh, not even for usage after the initial um, uh, assignment of uh, the uh, addresses. I was not involved in the discussion. I was just the chair because, in addition, I'm one of the co authors of the leasing um, of addresses or the denial for leasing of uh, addresses. So, my aim was to make sure th that uh, the time was kept. So, the conclusions of that panel, and here there may be a certain subjective subjectivity when I interpret the discussion, but I try to see the video many times and be as neutral as possible. Well, first of all, it's difficult to uh, define leasing. However, the policy do not justify the need. Remember that this is an APNIC. There's no need to give addresses to clients, nor do they allow the changing its use. If unless it's allowed by the staff. That is, somebody that was initially assigned addresses for ADSL and then they change the technology to GPON or a data center, obviously there is no problem. But it shouldn't be changed for it to lease it when there's no connectivity with the, with the client. Another important thing is that leasing could seem, especially for small organizations, small networks that don't have the purchasing power, or that they can't afford it or barely afford it, it could be a way for paying the price of transfers. They, they can't afford paying the transfers. However, the brokers confirmed in that panel that they can offer 
Uh, so that is illegitimate. So that is in favor of the leasing because I cannot pay the price. But if you are given the funds, then you no longer have uh, that uh, excuse. So the leasing is uh, uh, solving the problem of capex versus opex. Leasing causes problems. It generates. Uh, problems. It makes it difficult to track and uh, the reliability of the registry. And as a consequence, it generates a certain insecurity. And often it's a tool that was confirmed at the panel to use transient uh, addresses for abuses, attacks, or spam, etc. So that's all I wanted to give this introduction, because I think that these are aspects that may be treated at the panel here. And and just as a joke, so nobody will doubt of what I'm aiming at, what is the response? Well, of course, you know what I would answer, IPv6. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. Now let's start with the panel. Let's talk about IPv6. IP address leasings, current uh, practices, and uh, perspectives and outlooks. So let's invite then Douglas Fisher, Salvador Bertenbretter, Gonzalo Navarro, Nacho Mateo, and Hernán Giovanni. So as they join us here, yes, and Hernán Giovanni, sorry, he hadn't mentioned him. Hello. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, those of you who are uh, on uh, line. Do you have my presentation there? So let me make some comments. I think it's interesting. Uh, Jordi's uh, um, introduction is interesting. I brought some things. Well, here I'm just the chair, but I think that uh, we can uh, uh, take advantage of a couple of things. The first is that it took five years to have this discussion, to have this panel, and he mentioned something. Uh, he said that it was a controversial issue. and. My personal view is that we try to avoid the, the topic as if it were taboo, but you don't solve anything by not uh, talking. So uh, obviously, APNIC reaches uh, their conclusions, and they debated that. I think that each IRR may have uh, different views. We have representatives of other IRRs who can tell us what's happening elsewhere. And I think that as a community, we need to debate to debate this, and we are going to see it in the in on the slides. The spirit is: let's start discussing this. Let's uh, be uh, open in our discussions. We might not agree, but we might agree. So it's uh, through discussions that people reach agreements. So this is the agenda that is a bit, uh, we are already running late, but this is just to give you an idea, because Jordi already gave his introduction, that we're going to have a first set of questions. Then we are going to have a while for an open mic for participants, then a second set of questions, and then again, we'll open the floor for the participants. It's a two-hour session, although we started a bit late. And let me just uh, make a couple of clarifications before I introduce the panelists. This is, we are not debating policy that's uh, just, uh, that's going to happen in a while in the public policy forum. So it's not that what we are saying is good or bad. There, it's not policy. Nothing 
will determine the policy, any opinion about the policy, even if you say it here, that's something that you should uh, do at uh, the PPF. And uh, as it's an open and uh, relaxed, uh, uh, we, we're going to use uh, leasing, alquiler, arrendamiento. That's in Spanish, we use different words. But in English, we're going to always use the word leasing. So then we can become more specific as we talk of policy. We hope this discussion will be very rich. And of course, it's, it, we won't exhaust the topic, so it will continue later. We will, each panelist has two minutes. And for the open mic, it's going to be the same. We are going to give up to two minutes for anybody, if you want to use uh, uh, to speak up, we want to encourage uh, as many uh, voices as possible. So I ask uh, both uh, the panelists and the participants, please, my apologies if I have to stop you because you're going to long. And the real thing is that, well, working as a community, building a community requires being able to speak, uh, to, to talk openly, honestly. We must accept our differences. There's no doubt that we will disagree in some things, but we are all willing to reach consensus. So let's be uh, uh, frank, uh, admitting that there may be are people that disagree, but hopefully in, in the long run or in a short time, we can all agree. And if this turns into a policy, that's OK. And if it doesn't, it's OK, too. So now let me read here. We have the panelists. Gonzalo Navarro is Vice President, uh, 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 VP of Sales for Latin America of IPXO, a marketplace of uh, IP addresses. In the past, previously, he was Senior Manager of Public Policy at LATAM at Amazon and CEO of uh, the Latin American Association of the Internet, LI, and uh, member of ICON for two uh, um, consecutive periods. Nacho Mateo graduated from, uh, is, is, has 32 years of experience in IT in his first 10, he's from Spain. He was born in Madrid. Uh, initially, he worked in companies like IBM and uh, HP, and then for 12 years, he was uh, a broker um, uh, of internet services uh, in Spain, and uh, in the last 10 years, he has worked as a broker of uh, IPv4. Hernan Seoane is the general manager and the treasurer of Cavase. He's a public uh, a CPA of Buenos Aires, of the, and he has an MBA of uh, OCLA of the University of San Francisco. He was country manager of Inter.net Argentina and Inter.net Uruguay, and he's co-founder of SS. DNet, a company that is a pioneer of internet services in Argentina, and he was a professor of uh, IT um, of the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, Salvador uh, Berton Brett has worked for 20 years in telecom, working uh, on the equipment ISPs and uh, IXPs. Currently, he's co-founder and currently is the CEO of Pit Colombia and Peru. I exit to, ex to IXPs, and he has uh, uh, established connections in uh, uh, tenths of uh, the cities during his career. He has supported hundreds of ISPs to implement uh, good uh, technical and administrative uh, practices. Presently, he is the electoral commissioner of uh, LAC IX. He is an evangelist of BGP and peering Monday through Sunday. And finally, Douglas Fisher 
is a control and automation engineer. He has worked in telecom networks since 1999. He has worked as a pre-sale uh, engineer and implementation of technology integrators. He's a consultant of uh, networks uh, and services uh, servers in the corporate uh, segments of uh, internet uh, providers. And he says the secret of uh, um, of, uh, of uh, not uh, bored, getting bored is to say everything. He's quoting Voltaire. So, let's see the first set of questions. We would like to understand what you understand uh, by leasing broadly and what should not, what is it that a leasing should not be according to you? Well, I'm going to speak Portuguese. Uh, I I'm going to try to speak Portuguese alone and not a mix. So what is leasing and what is not leasing? To tell you the truth, um, if uh, for some time I've talked about this and I always get entangled with uh, definitions of uh, assignment delegation, whether it was given or not, we bring another set of words that are confusing for leasing. This is complicated, however, um, um, when you lease uh, something, you have a right on that, and uh, you rent it for somebody to use it. So that's my point of view. In uh, AP Nick, they say that somebody uh, the, g gets confused because if you say what is leasing, it has a financial connotation, and if you're speaking of renting, it doesn't uh, have a financial uh, connotation. But we are just, if we are thinking of the end users of the internet, if they're happy, if it works, and we don't. Uh, we don't need an IRR. We don't need somebody to configure the router. Well, we don't. We know that it's not like that. That it works. We need people configuring. We are small pieces that want uh, the internet to work well for the end user. What is leasing? Leasing is the way we have today to make the internet reach to the places where it's not reaching. So we want it to reach with a reasonable cost for the end user. That's it's, is, it the, is it the ideal thing? No, of course not. If I could uh, do without antibiotics, I would. But I know that sooner or later, I'll have an infection and I'll need antibiotics. Of course, if we can avoid them, antibiotics, then uh, we, we should, I think, least should be seen as the antibiotic. Hello, everyone. Well, leasing, in my view, it's not exactly the definition of a use. I see it rather as an option that enables a network that has no uh, um, uh, addresses of their own to use uh, the addresses of somebody else to provide uh, uh, service to the clients. Of course, it's not the ideal solution, and, uh, and we'll discuss in the panel whether it's a good thing or not, but it solves a problem that is uh, the scarcity of IPv4 addresses because new networks can no longer request uh, LACNIC to assign them resources in a reasonable time. That's the way I understand leasing, in my view. What is it not? Well, for instance, selling addresses or the uh, or some other use. If if a third party is using the resources uh, somebody else has, it, it would be uh, understood as leasing. So this is not a, this is not a legal definition, but this is how I understand it. 
Now, I understand that the long-term solution is IPv6, but I also understand that there is a transition period, and this makes leasing the topic of our talk today. Otherwise, you wouldn't be discussing this. In my opinion, the key word here is exhaustion. So, otherwise, we wouldn't be discussing leasing IP addresses. So, I think this leads us to consider different uh, measures. So, clarifying this of exhaustion or depletion, this is the way in which I would like to discuss this part of the panel regarding what leasing is and what it is not. So understanding the concept of exhaustion or depletion, many are not represented in this community. For example, at the traffic exchange point, one of the requirements is to have a slash 24, and they cannot obtain it. LACNIC doesn't have it. You have to wait seven to 10 years to get these resources aside. So there are people who are not seated at this panel or not seated in the room who do not belong to LACNIC. So this has to do with exhaustion. There are many voices that we're not listening, so I'm going to just be the speaker of those people who don't manage to get addresses. They cannot connect to a traffic exchange point, and this has to do with what I think leasing is, this is to give small internet providers the opportunity who, for reasons of depletion, cannot obtain resources that will allow them to connect to a traffic exchange point or to connect to the internet with their own resources or an ASN and be part of our community. Thank you. Hello, everyone. What is leasing? I am a broker. It's to make money. It's as simple as that. So maybe this is not the most academic position in the community, but brokers are not here as a charity organization. So there are ISPs, there are operators that have these available, and they want to earn money. So leasing has to be distinguished. When this is from the operator that prize services to the customers, and this is given by the major operators who offer this to their customers, but not a social service, but it is a leasing when they do. this is given in exchange for money to another ISP. So this is a standpoint that only few people will defend this, but as a broker, at least we want to explain this. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here. This is a long-awaited panel and also a very necessary discussion in order to inform and explain what we do. Now, leasing probably in this community, or what we're discussing now, is a concept that can be understood in many, many different ways. The way I see it, this is an opportunity. This is a reality. This is something that has to occur. This is bringing together supply and demand. Like Ms. Hernán Cioane said, this is opportunity so that the smaller Organizations can not only join the community, but also carry out their business. This is an opportunity for connectivity with the region. Now, it is interesting. It was interesting to listen to Jordi and the conclusions he drew from the APNIC forum. This is a different region. This is a different context. We have different needs. We have different realities. We have different network topologies. So let us consider this and let us 
consider the region, we are aware that there are different ways to see this. But if necessary, well, it is absolutely necessary. If this is an element that contributes to connectivity in Latin America, yes. And like we heard from Nacho, we are not a charity organization. This has to do with supply and demand. This is something that connects people or those organizations that really have a need for this. It's the smaller organizations that need this. So it meets a need that is important. Therefore, I'm very pleased that we're having this debate today and that we have this information. And then a further element to set the context. Because leasing is a reality, not in Latin America yet, but this is a reality that is occurring. This is something that is happening every day. <clears throat> it is also important to start to discuss and speak with the community to see what are those elements that make leasing something secure, responsible, resilient, and that it also supports the development of building business communities and networks. Thank you. We're going to go into that last part of your comments. Now, let's go on to the second question. How do you know how leasing works in other regions? Maybe Nacho and Gonzalo can briefly answer. But we also have among the participants representatives from other RIRs, from RIPE and from ARIN. So if after the responses you feel that you can go up to the microphones and tell us more about your experience in other RIRs, this would be an um, important contribution so that we all learn what is happening in other RIRs and have more elements to add to the debate. As you're aware, I'm from Spain, I'm from Europe, and my RIR is RIPE NCC. I am allowed to do this, and it is also known that I have IP addresses here from RIPE. I have brought these addresses here. And in some cases, I have purchased IPs here and have taken these to Europe where leasing is allowed. And I'm leasing this here. But this is completely legal. How can I spell this out? RIPE NCC in its policies allows us to lease IP addresses. There are no limitations to this, no restrictions. So based on that concept, this is what I'm most aware of, what I know best. And of course, from I understand in the APNIC region, some IP addresses are also being leased. In this region, I have been asked to lease IP addresses in countries, and of course, I haven't done so because the policies don't allow me. But in LACNIC, leasing occurs. Well, just to add on to what Nacho was saying, it is totally allowed in Europe. Le address leasing and best practices manuals are also available that describe how this should be done. So this is a growing trend. This is a reality, as I was saying. This is something that is happening. And then it is also quite interesting to see or to identify certain things of what can be done and what cannot be done. And in Latin America, too, a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, I went to a forum in Mexico when this was sort of demythified. There is also a lack of knowledge in the region for reasons regarding policies of what is allowed and what is not allowed. In the case of legacy resources here in the region, this can be transferred without any issues. Now, LACNIC assigned resources, as Nacho was saying, these at present 
cannot be leased, but hopefully in the future. But they can be transferred. And what is occurring, and this is something with, with, that we were discussing with Nacho Siani, and this is a topic that you will have to expand on, but the point is that, as Nacho was saying, this is perfectly legal. These addresses are transferred to Europe. And these addresses are transferred to Europe and come back to the region through leasing because it is perfectly possible that an ISP or can lease IP addresses from other RIRs. And that is what is happening. So I'm sure Hernan will be expanding on this com concept, but this also has implications on the costs. It has costs for the companies that demand these addresses. I'm sorry, but you have to wrap up. <laughs> and I'm not, I don't speak that much. Okay, now I'd like to ask the people from the RIRs who are here, Arin or Ripe, if we'd like to go up to the microphone. You have a couple of minutes, and we'd love to know what is happening in the region. Buenos dias, Justin Chan Sweet, y soy Chief Customer Officer in Arin. Y hay dos aspectos distintos a los que me quiero referir, a los efectos de obtener IPv4 de Arin. Estoy están casi en la lista de espera, pero el leasing no es need. So we would not if you came and said I want to go on the wait list, I want a 22 because I want to lease this space, it would be denied. Um, also for transfers, if you say uh, I want to buy this space because I want to lease it, that would be denied for the recipient. Um, the other aspect though is on space that's already out there with the users. With the uh, with our customers, if they have IPv4 space today, and they wish to lease it or do whatever they wish to do, transfer whatever, um, then that is uh, something that Aaron doesn't get involved in. We don't tell them they can't. We don't go and audit them and try to take the space back. Once they have the space and they've had the space, they can uh, pretty much do uh, whatever they need to do with that space, other than. One caveat to that is if they get space from the wait list, they're not supposed to lease it for five years. And if we get fraud reports that they are, we will um, investigate that and possibly take that space back. Good morning. I will speak in English. Buen dia. Soy Marco Schmidt y gerente del servicio de Ripe. Members can assign part or whole allocation to somebody else, and those assignments, there is no further requirement attached uh, what connection they have with the member and that other company. There's even the possibility to, uh, in the, our policy land, to do a temporary transfer, so really even in our registry it will be updated, and after a while it's coming back, so some people could call this also leasing. And due to the fact that in our region there is no need evaluation at all, so regardless if you get address space from the waiting list or if you get it for a transfer, we don't even care, we don't know for what it's intended to use. So in that sense, somebody can get address space and he can assign it, slash lease it, whatever, to another party immediately. So in that sense, I can confirm what uh, Nacho mentioned, that we are not involved in that and we don't um, have a any position to that. Thank you. Aclarar solamente lo que dijo Nacho por APNIC. This has to be in the microphone session. So let us go on to the next question. Then we have the open mic, so that's not a problem. What problems does leasing create and what are the solutions? 
I'd like to ask you all to be brief because we start to run out of time. What are the problems that are caused? What are problems are caused by leasing? Well, before we answer this question, we have to separate the different types of use that uh, we have uh, for renting IPs or for leasing IPs. Uh, the wrong use, something that uh, is done uh, erroneously, mistakenly, or also doing it correctly. So I am really bothered when I see people that are against uh, leasing of IP addresses who like to mix the correct use of leasing uh, for, for spoofing or for spamming or for other negative things. And they want to mix all that, put everything in a bag. And the, the people that use IP leasing correctly is very different from those that do it erroneously, those that use uh, do things uh, adequate and uh, do the subdelegations of the end user. As, uh, and as they are ISPs, they receive that block. And we have, for instance, a company with a slash 30 that uh, does uh, the correct assignments. And I, I think that those are very intimate things. They are closely related to this question. And what is uh, the problem that leasing causes well. It's that you can't track an inadequate behavior in the internet. I think that that's the main problem it causes. And how can we mitigate this? Well, by doing things right, the way they should be done when you are in a regular assignment using uh, the proper anti and the spoofing uh, mechanisms and the uh, validation uh, of origin uh, correctly too. So the companies that don't have IPv4 and that have uh, uh, end users that need uh, connectivity, they receive assistance. Of course, it won't solve the problems of companies with one million um, uh, clients, only if they have two, three, four, five uh, users. Only a couple of minutes, uh, uh, please Re limit yourself to two minutes. Well, I'm going to talk about the problems that it solves. I think that as Hernan pointed out, many ISPs, the many uh, organizations that started late can do peering. That's a very important thing as an IXP. We consider that to be very important with and without leasing IPs, they wouldn't be able to do peering and they wouldn't be able to uh, implement the good practices that we are discussing here. And leasing solves that. So what's happening? All those ISPs at present are doing leasing from addresses of other regions of Ripe, Arin, etc. But they do it. They have no other choice. So if we, uh, but it's it's a truth that of course we promote uh, the implementation of IPv6, but we can't uh, deny that people need IPv4. So what are the problems? Well, that the uh, you can't log, you can't do the, the track and trace, as Douglas said. And but if we solved that, it could then we would be able to ensure a correct usage, undue use of IP addresses. I think nobody in the panel would defend that. I think that we are all against that kind of use. We all want it to be well used, and I think that that enables us. And the other thing that uh, leasing can allow us is that if we can do it correctly, the organizations that are under using the IP prefixes will have an incentive with good use, and if they have resources that are not being used, they can release them to increase availability to the market. Because today, there are companies that are underusing, and and those IPs cannot be used because uh, they can't be leased. And now, yes, uh, let me go back with the message I already said. That is depletion, and here, common sense is necessary when there's depletion. Who will return a resource? Who will return a resource if there's depletion? Because we are no longer recovering resources, but 
if we have this leasing, not leasing, nobody will go back uh, a resource because if they need it later, they won't be able to get it because it's depleted. So common sense tells me nobody will uh, return a resource. So if nobody will return a resource, at least as a community, let's accept uh, leasing. Let's just uh, apply common sense. We all know that this is done. So let's not try to cover the sun with a finger. Just uh, let's try and produce the proper policies so that this that we know is already taking place and it's the only way out for small ISPs to connect to an IXP at least, to uh, do that openly. So what are the problems it creates? What are the problems it uh, solves? Well, I think that in this panel, as a community, we are addressing the situation. We are putting it openly on the table for the sake of good practices so this can be done properly. Let me repeat the word depletion. but. Uh, depletion of resources, the IPs are worth more. What depletion per permits is that if somebody has a fund of resources, that's worth money. So we're talking of money. So that depletion makes it possible for the ISPs with a cost that they didn't have to be able to get started. The, uh, uh, of course, uh, what are the problems it solves? It opens the market. I don't see any problems with leasing. It works well. We have been able to solve the problem of geolocation. It can be solved in a reasonable time. I don't see any problems as long as you abide by the policy of each IRR. That's acceptable. If you don't, it's not uh, acceptable. Because if it's not permitted in the region, I think that we won't, uh, we won't participate. At least we try to do things right. Well, money is good. That's, that's, a, that's a true argument. Uh, that's true. And I share many of the arguments that uh, the rest of the panelists have said. I want to emphasize yes, depletion, the need for connectivity, and also asking What's happening in Latin America? What are the topics that it would solve? Believe it or not, it solves the implementation of IPv6 activities that cannot migrate to IPv6. And we know it, we've discussed it with universities, with training centers, small ISPs, medium-sized ISPs, people that do not have the resources to migrate to IPv6. They don't have the technical. The, the, although LACNIC is doing a wonderful job training people, but people need tra further training. They need to buy hardware. And if there are resources that are idle and the uh, people who have them can lease them. Well, they're going to enable those who cannot uh, to do that leap to IPv6. It enables connectivity through IPv6. It enables the entry of uh, uh, players that are excluded from the system because there's a waiting list, a seven-year waiting list. So you can shorten that uh, waiting, uh, waiting list uh, time. So, as Alfredo mentioned a couple of weeks ago, there are over a thousand companies that will have a slash 24, uh, waiting for a slash 24 in Latin America. That is impossible. It's not an issue. It's it's not uh, that LACNIC is to blame. That's a reality. That's what, what's happening. So all those things are solved. As to the problems, I agree with Douglas. And 
and with uh, Nacho that the problems that create in terms of reputation of the IP organization, those things have blacklist, uh, have a complete uh, screening of uh, who's leasing and who holds that IP. That, that can be solved if you abide by the rules and if the rules are clear. Thank you. Now, yes, Jordi, while you, you walk, just a comment. You said something, Nacho, that is, as long as people abide by the rules and the brokers respect the rules of each IRR, what's not said is that it, what may be happening is that many people are not abiding by the rules. Uh, so let's discuss it later so we won't use the time of the open mic. Buenos días, soy Good morning. Correa de Telecom Wesley Correa Antes of que nada, Telecom agradecer al panel Let me start by thanking the panel for this excellent possibility for the community to interact and to debate about this because this is absolutely relevant these days with a community vision. I've participated in this community for many years, and I know, I feel it's impossible for the ISPs to survive with IPv6 only. And the only way out, really, is leasing IPv4 addresses. So we have the other side. We have medium-sized ISPs that have a certain number of users, and they need to invest a lot in terms of money to buy CGN uh, solutions to maintain IPv4 uh, working in tandem with IPv6. And my question is for Nacho, maybe you can answer later. Why Nacho, who's European, can lease these IPv4s and turn that into money, and no other entities here can turn that into money to reinvest in a C GN and give a chance to those in the long queue of IPv4 to interconnect to an IXP or at least for their networks to survive and be competitive in the market. Let's wait for the question. Jordi, what I wanted to say earlier, if I understood, Nacho says that uh, it in APNIC, they can do leasing. That's not right. The staff has confirmed in their policy list that it's against the policy. So leasing is not admitted. And if they detect cases, they investigate and they recover the addresses. And in AFNIC, it's absolutely the same. And then a general consideration to what has been said so far in the panel. I agree that having addresses, having a small pool of IP for addresses, is necessary for the transition, not the migration of IPv6. We all agree about that. However, as was concluded, was clearly concluded in the APNIC panel that I mentioned earlier, for that purpose, we have a transfer system, and those transfers can turn into a financial solution that is equivalent or even cheaper than leasing. So it's a mechanism. So the, the mechanism to solve that is already available. Thank you, Jordi. Ricardo, and then if there are no more comments by the audience, Nacho will answer. Ricardo Patara, I, I speaking on a personal I'd like to congratulate the panel. It's a problem that's circulating, and it needs to be addressed. We have to discuss it now, constructive criticism. Everybody there made comments that are favorable to leasing. Um, I don't see anybody opposing to it. Maybe in the next panel, we will have a, a, a different opinions. Now. The, it was said that if, if if you have an asset and you want to rent it, you can do that. But but um, IPv4 is not an asset; it's a service. It's a number, and if there is no service tied to that number, then uh, it's no good. So something that uh, worries me, and it may be a risk, and many th people mentioned it. It's the money, um, and the. 
also mentioned why is it that can that some can make profit of IPV for and and not here because and that worries me because they even uh, mentioned the that an ISP c- could um, use uh, some IPV4 for CGNAT and uh, then the rest uh, would be used to get some money now. IP4 addresses were never used for that. You need to have it to provide services to the customers. That should not be the provider's role. Natra, I think you have the three questions to answer. First of all, I'd like to apologize because I'm focusing my argument on money. So this is being leased and this is being leased and allow me to say this is not complying with the policy i'm not going to go into uh, 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 so uh, there are sufficient colleagues who are defending this issue of the isps now to answer wesley it is not fair why can they do so and why cannot I do so? Why cannot I charge for leasing IPs and why can the community do it? I'm on the side of the community too. So if the policies, if the current policies allow me to lease IPs, why shouldn't I do so? And I agree with you and I insist. This is not fair and let's leave it at that. Now, Jordi, we have heard that AP Nick could lease and I'm sorry if I'm mistaken, So one of the things that was said previously, and it's quite true, leasing will allow investing. And I'm sorry to use the financial jargon. It will allow to make investments so that other operators can progress. Transfers are not the solution because there are operators that don't have the capacity to buy or transfer a slash 24. A slash 24 is very expensive and an an, an incipient operator needs other solutions. So the solution for them is leasing. And also for those operators, that allows them to invest in what they think is convenient. They're going to invest in carrier grade NAT and transition. But the reality is that we really have to look at the altruistic standpoint and say that they're going to use this to implement IPv6. Now, I'd like to make a comment. Let us give five minutes for all the answers because everybody is asking for the floor. Five minutes for all of you. I will be super brief. First of all, APNIC is APNIC, RIPE is RIPE, ARIN is ARIN. And as far as I'm aware, the realities and the things that occur there are meaningful and a raison d'etre because this Uh, regional issues, and these are conclusions that, frankly speaking, I'm not asking the staff uh, to, to, to change this. Now, a dose of reality, no, limited transfers are not a solution, even if they are levered with uh, funding for a slash 24. It is far cheaper in reality to lease, and you can lease one month two months, for three months, for four, one year, four years, from a slash 16 to a slash 24. That is the flexibility that allows, that is allowed for by leasing. Now, altogether, transfers are a very positive system for the general ecosystem in the Latin American region so that they can, ISPs can grow, can participate, and can approach the business chain. And this can generate, at the same time, more business in the region. Business in the region that will not only allow to monetize the IP addresses, but it also creates an ecosystem that has also grown. And this market that is growing with all the benefits this implies. Thank you, Hernan. I will be very brief. From the standpoint of money, let 
we are speaking about a slash 24. This is objectively. This costs 35 re reales per IP, $35,000. A slash 24 lease costs $300. If we are going to lease for 48 months, it's 300 times 48. You apply the correction fee, and it will be a similar amount. But let us assume that I have 5,000 clients, but I don't have 35,000 US dollars. So I need to respond to the people. Yes, it is cheaper, but it's not only cheaper, but this is money that I don't have. And I have customers that I have to respond to. So this is another point. I see hundreds of ASNs. They have a slash. 18 slash 19. Let us assume this is a slash 22 and they have 5,000 clients. 5,000 don't fit in 1,024, so they're probably doing NAT. If they buy a CG NAT box that is a decent one, they're going to manage with a slash 23 to add 10 to 12,000 clients. So are you going to return that slash 23? If you return it, then I charge half the amount. I think nobody is ever going to return that. So what are they going to do with this? They're going to transfer this to RIPE, and RIPE will, no, they have to work to check whether work is done properly. So there's nothing against you. Now, between LACNIX ASN, we don't need to have these two brokers. I'm sorry to be, sorry to be so uh, candid, but we don't need these brokers. I think that from one ASN to another, we can do business and without the need of having a broker. So f f if for bureaucratic reasons, we have to use resources that I don't like, unfortunately. So let me be very brief. I'm in favor of free market. So if you allow to make these transfers, you should also allow to lease, allow the ISP to do what it wishes, if they wish to buy or to lease these addresses. But I wouldn't impose that as a community. I would put the two options on the table and give those who don't have the addresses to have the opportunity of doing so. Either they buy it because they have the money or they lease these. Yes, Salvador. 1,000 clients behind a slash 30. This is what I have seen in Peru a couple of times. 1,000 clients behind a slash 30 with a service that works terribly bad. So IPv6 is necessary, there's no doubt. We're trying to promote that too. But this is a reality that still require, that we still require IPv4. And these small operators need to offer a good service. So they do need IPv4. So today, these operators that although in a world where the financial market can work perfectly well and today can obtain uh, credits or loans, could buy a prefix and could pay this comfortably. And nevertheless, we face a reality in Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, and Guatemala and other countries of the region. There is a big informal situation. There are small entrepreneurs that don't have access to loans to pay the $8,000 or $10,000 that they have to pay for a slash 24. So there's no other way around this but to lease. They have to do this through the IP brokers. They have a tier one broker that is well known so as not to mention any names. And this is what is happening today. So it is important to see this situation and to figure out a solution for the region. Thank you. Carlos, we have remote questions. Yes, Arnan. We have two questions that, and these are divided into two parts. I'm going to read this out in Spanish, and my colleague will read this in Portuguese. Jorge Gonzalez is asking in greetings. Could someone briefly explain how the process has to follow someone requiring IPv4? for addresses from company A and company B who have sufficient addresses. And what is the process that has to be followed? The question is a bit confusing, he says. And if they need to have their own ISN? Well, I think there's something wrong with the question he explains. Could someone briefly explain? Could someone briefly explain how 
in the process of someone who needs IP for addresses, company A, and then you have company B that has sufficient addresses, what would be the process required so that B can lease addresses from A? What occurs in those cases? What occurs with the B's ASNs and how does A do if they already have their own ASNs? Thank you. Well, only one answer and very briefly, we're running out of time and we still have the remaining half of the session. This is a very simple process. This depends on the platform, but this connects supply and demand. So you have, in our case, we haven't named the price. The price is named by the person who wishes to rent these, and that's it. This is how it works. Second question. Cesar Augusto Camacho Sierra is asking whether it is necessary to lease this to ISPs. This gives the opportunity to access ISPs, DNS, and other services. So this is more of a comment. So this is the same question in Portuguese. They're repeating the question. I think this is more a statement than a question. Yes, it has been written as a comment very, very rapidly. So, we didn't mention one of the points, and this has to be commented on. When we speak about leasing IP addresses, necessarily we are speaking of an ASM who leases an IP block, and I understand that this should be clear to most of us. Now, the question reveals this. There are cases that operate today with a slash 30 that are no, not an ASN and they wish to re rent IPs and that's not the purpose of this. Now we have to clearly state this. We want those individuals to become an ASN and that they have an IPv6. Now there is a quote and let me see how this can be translated. In Brazil, we say, uh, I mean, this is just um, crying. Uh, you add something more to something that is already lost. So is this a lie or not? So I want that person to really have an ASN, to have an IPv6, and why? And they have to do things correctly. If they can do things correctly with having IPv4. So now we have a second set of questions. Let's try and be as brief as possible so that we have time to have the open mic. I'd like to invite the community because those who participated in the open mic are those who we know very well. I'm very happy that they are participating. So let's go on to the next questions. What other alternatives do we have to leasing for those who cannot pay for the transfers? So let us start in the opposite direction. Let's start from that end. So, um, the question is a bit odd. Either it's a transfer or it is leasing. So I don't know if there are many more alternatives other than donations. I don't know. But well, maybe that could be a possibility. But now, going a bit backwards in the two minutes that I have, these are excellent alternatives. So depending on the model, depending on the need, and depending on the size, 
because there can be companies that need to have something that is more permanent because of the way they are building their networks. And in that sense, transfers are good. Now, once again, the flexibility proposed by leasing, especially for smaller companies that don't have sufficient capital to to be active and to lease resources that are unused. I think these are really very valid alternatives in a context and aware of the needs of the region. So this is a very necessary option. What other, alter what other alternatives are there for those uh, who can't pay the transfer? You either transfer it or buy it, or you rent it, you lease it, but there are no other solutions. So those ISPs that now have been waiting for seven years in the waiting list to get some IPv4 addresses, if they don't have the possibility of leasing and with transfer, then that, can't, that ISP cannot exist. So. There will be no more ISPs. There won't be any new faces. That's my view. Yes, I fully agree with Nacho and with Gonzalo. In my view, there's no other way to do it. But there's a black market or a blue market. That is, this will continue to be done under a radar. People will lease the addresses. And as a community, will say, why are we doing it that way if we might be able to do it more honestly? And a different thing that could happen with this is what we just discussed with Gonzalo the other day, is emptying the addresses of our region because I can transfer. I, uh, as I said, I transfer to RIPE. There was a talk in Argentina of LACNIC stating that 165,000 IPv4 addresses were transferred to other countries. That's a huge number of addresses that leave the region, first because they are better paid in abroad because today it's an asset, but the second thing is that they are allowed to send them back to, to lease them to our uh, uh, region and I'm I'm an Argentinian. Uh, we are the champions of inflation. The fact that he sells it in euros or in dollars multiplies the cost by four. Instead, um, but if I pay it in Argentinian pesos, paying Argentinian tax, that that would be four times as uh, uh, four times cheaper. Maybe the companies in the region find it much more. Uh, much cheaper and the prices may be better and we don't have to pay for exchange rates going to an international broker uh, so to lease them. So that's my conclusion in the end. That's a good question. I've been thinking of it all this time and I don't see a good alternative today. I see that people will continue to do internet in a slash 30. I don't think it's a good alternative at all. And as others have said earlier, being able to make this transparent and to give an opportunity to the region's providers that are not using the resources efficiently, that would enable others to make use of it. I think that that's a solution. I think it would be the best. Today, what's happening is that ISPs are looking for IPv4 in other places. There are many, many problems that, uh, and I do, but I don't see any good alternatives. All right. The question is, are we talking of, we are talking of uh, uh, allegedly legal solutions accepted by the norm or other solutions that are not legal because there's a lot of that and it happens. So, of, for instance, there may be a case of somebody that leases a slash IPv6 and then it is sub-leased and that is, that's, that's wrong and it's happening because 
of admission to our current norms. So I'm going to let me apologize, Patara, because you are right. Nobody here is against, and we are wrong here, because we have a panel debating. We are doing it late, as you mentioned earlier, because we are discussing a topic now that should have been debated five years ago. Jordi also mentioned AP Nick. And each reason has its own timing. We talked about the IRR transfers much later than the rest. So each of us follows uh, has its own timing. And there are controversial things about these statistics. Never did I see that LACNIC, uh, I never see this controversy before two years. There won't be any definitions one side or the other before two years. We'll have to debate a lot before that solution comes. And this type of things exist. They're everywhere. If there's anybody that is selling transit to another in that sale, they yield a slash 24 and they check with the network that they are uh, of both. And maybe you have more than 3,000 kilometers, but that's not a transit sale. However, there's a piece of paper, there's a document that they are doing it to defend themselves. This is something that is wrong. Subleasing is something wrong. They're because then it uh, then one person would uh, sublease it uh, once and again. So we don't have laws. We, we have regulations about this. And from a legal point of view, you can't do this. So as we are going to do it, let's do it right. I am quite a visionary, so I have a suggestion. Let's make it much more cumbersome and much stricter in terms of good practices than it would happen with the regular IPs. So are you going to lease? Well, you can't if you don't have a ROA. If you don't have a reverse DNS, you can't. If you don't have IRR, if you don't have this or that, you can't. So we need to be much stricter if we are to do that. That's my position. Thank you. All the all right, what is expected? or what is required for both uh, parties of uh, the leasing. There's another mic. Thank you. Oh, Douglas, well, he took uh, it. Uh, 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to start making jokes if I want to beat him in time, in terms of time. So what do you require? You require the party's will, uh, supply and demand, need. Now, the interesting thing about this question is what can we do beyond? And that is one of the things that we have to debate in the region because uh, aside from the fact of a leasing, is good or bad, we all agree that it is necessary, is what type of leasing, under what rules, what are the good practices that we should implement. RPKI, for instance, should it be included by default in when there is leasing or not? How do you take care of the IP addresses? Maybe there's a new concept that taking care of the reputation of the IP that you give to a platform like ours or a broker um, like Nat, uh, G. it's very important because the reputation of the IP implies knowing uh, where it comes from, what are the parties that uh, intervene, and uh, uh, how was it using, uh, who is going to use it, and what's been the track of use. Uh, because maybe they are leasing it for one or two months. So taking good care of the reputation of the IP is very important. The blacklist of bad actor, uh, actors is absolutely necessary. There, there is, well, there's a second thing, is whether the lists have to be public or not because of security issues. But it's very important, screening. 
let me make another uh, joke, screening of who participates in the market and who's the uh, actor, both the person who offers it and the person who rents it, who leases it. That's very important. So those are the uh, least of the best practices that the system has to implement so that the parties and the community and the IRR may be reassured of what's being done. Thank you. Nacho. What is required or expected from both parties for the leasing? Well, good practices, whitelist, blacklist, Let's preserve the reputation of the IP because it has a direct uh, impact on the value of the IPs. That is true. In a, a clean IP is worth more than IP in the blacklist because people won't uh, want it. Let's be clear about it. So let's reach an agreement because what we have is a market uh, that may be black, gray, whatever color they are being rented. So we are putting a question of things that are being done that are not being seen, but really people are leasing. I won't give any names, but there's a booth downstairs that have got many people say, Nacho, why don't you pay for my IPs? So that's the issue. What do you need? Reaching an agreement, money. Thank you, Nacho. I'm going to highlight the expectation that both parties have when leasing. Nacho, a few minutes ago, said supply and demand. Now, let me stand first in the sight of the ISP user that has no uh, IP addresses. What would they expect from this to increase the supply in the market? because that will re lead to a drop in the prices. So from the side of ISPs, if we allow this, there will be more bidders, more supply, and consequently, uh, the price will be more competitive. Now let me stand in the side of people with a surplus of IPs. And when there's depletion, nobody will return them because if in the future they need it, I have no way to get them back. So during a depletion, I say, well, I have them, I won't return them. So I allow that ISP that has a surplus of ISP uh, addresses, my common sense tells me that they won't return it, to monetize that idle resource. I'm allowing those who have it that um, if they're not using them to be able to monetize it. And the other is um, being open about a situation. As Nature said, if this is happening, if you show the way you can prove it, why do you have to do it that way if you can do it more honestly, more frankly, if the community agrees? So these are the two uh, expectations that I have about this. I think that it is important to have a framework that will enable me to do this in order. And I'm speaking from the uh, perspective of, I, uh, of an IXP, and I want to implement RPKI. But in practice, I have new members. They uh, uh, lease a prefix. I know Nacho would prefer it. They, they, they uh, lease it from uh, Got it, and immediately the RPKI will be broken. I would love to be able to solve the problem in the region. I think that that needs to be done in Paraguay, as Douglas said. If somebody is going to do to misuse that as a community, nobody wants it, and we shouldn't uh, allow it. But if it's for a legal use, for for a good purpose, that should be allowed, in my view. Well, I don't agree with you, Nacho. It's not just a matter of money. As a matter of fact, when we have a commercial relation, and I used to work for a company many years ago, and I had a slash 23 of Embratel. I wasn't an ASN, and I had a slash 23. And afterwards, in that company, I helped them, and it became 
uh, DSN, and we started routing Embratel slash 23 with another transit, of course, with an agreement with no money involved on this specific issue with respect to this block. So I would say that it's interest, demand, as Hernan said, and of course, money is in the middle. Uh, well, yes, because it's necessary. So we are considering this a lot from the standpoint of the provider of the ISP. Now, what occurs with the data centers? The data centers will also have to lease these IPs. So what is the outlook for these stakeholders, for these players? Well, I don't have an answer to that. So there is something that we cannot conclude here. We cannot conclude anything here. The only thing we have are doubts, and we have many doubts, and we'll try to answer these in the time in the coming times. We have a brief question now. We haven't yet opened the mic, so please bear with us until we finish this round of questions. So let us ask this final question before we open the microphone. How can we avoid leasing becoming a tool for abuse activities? This was mentioned by many of you, but let's not be repetitive. Let's be brief. Yes, once again, I want to stress this. We do 100% screening on both sides. We look at blacklists, publicity, informing the user. All these are tools. This, There are things that you cannot avoid, no matter. You know, automated systems are very helpful. Now, issues about geolocation and platforms that contribute to geolocation, this is very important. So all these set of tools that allow you to take care of the most important asset, which is the IP's reputation. So we have to stress that point. And of course, expect that those companies that work in the market meet these minimum standards. This is very important. To avoid leasing being used as a tool for abuse activities, well, we do have a bit of know-how in this case, but we can avoid these being used as a tool for abuse. You really can detect when they start using IPs for abuse purposes. But what I would suggest, and I know that the brokers I know and that do things properly, you can really trust these. We are the first ones who are interested in not having a bad reputation because the quality of the IPs has been affected or the reputation or whatever. But let us not try to find an additional justification because of the reason why that ISP is going to need this. Let us not enter that area because otherwise we'll be putting stones on the path. We have sufficient pa problems with the justifications and we start entering further justifications. Well, if anyone starts thinking about including justifications for leasing IPs, this is uh, making us enter an uh, area which makes start making the market a darker area. Now, I'm quite practical on this point. If I lease my IP addresses, I am responsible in the sense of who am I leasing these to so that they use this properly. So I would take the necessary precautions in the contract I sign with the person who rent these IP addresses that they cannot do X, Y, Z. I'm going to state the parameters so this abuse does not take place because once I return, get these back, these won't be of any use at all to me. So in the end, this was not good business. This is like a leasing contract. There we state you cannot have animals, for example, in the functional unit. So we spell this out in the contract. And this is for the interest of those who lease this. This is on the person who leases these out. On the la side of the registration, you have to register and sub-assign these correctly so there's someone responsible 
in the sense of who's using these resources. So these are responsibilities, those who sign the lease agreement, because they are the ultimate person responsible, entity responsible for that, and then to register these correctly at LACNIC, who is going to do the sub-assignment. I agree with all those points. And quite clearly, there are tools available. And if someone does this badly, they should be included in a blacklist. But most of the people, and I believe in the trust, that in, that I trust that people will use this properly if we have the necessary tools to filter out those who do poor use. We know who, these, who they are. We're not going to lease these to them. They are bad actors. But the vast majority of those who are interested in renting IP addresses want to make proper use of these addresses, and we shouldn't limit the number of those who wish to do proper use. And as a community, we should not allow those who want to make proper use of these addresses cannot do this for that reason. Now, my answer to that is quite simple. This is co-responsibility, co-liability. When I mention this word, I'm referring to all the parties involved in the process, if it is an ASN or whatever. So the two sides are responsible for this. If we involve a broker in between, the broker is also part of this. So there has to be a legal representation to make this happen. So if there is a crime, for example, pornography, everyone has to explain this. So if they say they want, don't want to have the responsibility, then go and find this elsewhere. But we are only pieces of a puzzle. We are here to figure out solutions to the user's lives. If the broker is a responsible entity, they're going to take care of the requirements and that these are respected. If we wish to lease IPs, we will behave properly because otherwise they won't be able to ever lease these out. So this is a tool we have. Just a brief comment on my side before opening the mic, which I see has a very nice cue. Now, listening to all the comments, I quite agree with Ricardo, who said that there are different motivations and different arguments, but I see that there is like a thread of understanding the need for accepting this modality. But in a while, at the policy forum, we have quite a different position that this panel has stated. So as a community, the first thing that we have to consider is that there's not something that is correct or something that is wrong. But this is part of the discussion process that we have to have. We temporarily have to have different positions, but these different positions and discussing these issues will allow us to reach a consensus and to reach an agreement. This is part of the process. So different positions is not about wrestling. This is just the way I see things. But I just wanted to make that comment in order to close this part. So we now go over to the Q&A session, to the open mic session. Please introduce yourselves. <coughs> so with the years, one starts to forget what we thought previously. I stood up early, so I wouldn't forget what I was going to say. <coughs> and you have just allowed me to, uh, he had given me a cue. I have been part of the technical community for quite a number of years. And this is a meeting of the technical community, but we're speaking about business. So there's no black and white. And that is what I understand. We have to take this into account because this has become a business. So there are other values that are at stake in order to be able to conduct that business. And I take the words expressed by Hernán There are no IP4, so you cannot deliver to the members of this community. So we have to include this as part of the discussion, maybe later on. 
maybe in the following panel as a community what do we want to have where do we want to go because very clear this is about business we're speaking about money there's no doubt as to that so we have to incorporate that into our the way we think where do you want to take this what you have just concluded is the reason why i stood up here let us speak about what we have to speak that was it that was my reflection thank you fernando good morning fernando frediani first of all i apologize that in the panel you haven't included anyone who has a different position, an opposite position in the question you asked regarding making a list of the problems of leasing IPs. Unfortunately, we couldn't prepare that list. So let me make that list over here. So we heard about noble reasons to allow leasing IP addresses. However, I think you are forgetting to find more moral and legal options. For example, using an upstream block to do transfers. I personally participated in cases where it was possible to use for a given period of time a slash 28 block, a slash block a slash 29 for a new one, creating a customer base to achieve invoicing that a, a, a turnover that allows you to work and then to work in IPv6. So if you gradually work in that direction, this is legal and even more moral than transfers. We all suffer from scarcity, but apparently there is a strong resistance in relearning to work with limited amounts, to do a lot with limited resources, with limited numbers of IPv4 addresses. People think it is impossible. Second point, and maybe more important, there are rules that we all have to abide by. Why someone who is willing to pay more can advance in front of all those who are there in the waiting list? Why someone who is willing to pay more shouldn't be subject to provide justification for using these IPs by that ISPs? Because when you have to pay a price, but you don't have to justify things. So why those who are willing to pay f feel they are better than the others? And we speak about free market. I understand what you're saying, but it is free market. Let us do free market with our assets. If I buy a router, if I buy a server and I create a service, the IPs are not an asset that belong to us as a company or individually. We cannot do free market with something that doesn't belong to us. That is wrong. That's one of the moral points, one of the moral issues. So rapidly, Fernando, wrap up. So when we incentivate the use of IP addresses, we're also promoting a market that increases inflation, this makes leasing or transfers more difficult because they're increased price. They won't be a problem. Let us be more conservative than liberal in this sense and not promote a market that I think is bad and then try to let's try to relearn and know how to work with limited resources and have more correct alternatives because we have a need here to justify these resources and without that need, well this is no man's land. Thank you, Fernando. Good morning. I represent an association in Colombia of 350 ISPs. So what do we see is occurring in Colombia? In Colombia, we see that we are working in scarcity. In Colombia, we get one giga capacity with a slash 30. And we have seen colleagues in our group that have 1,500 subscribers working like as Salvador was saying, and with a slash 30. In addition to that, 350 ISPs have been registered in this group, and only 5% have been registered at LACNIC. This is because they don't have money. There is no money. So here, those who registered and going to enter the CDN world and the content world, I have to tell them, hey, here, you have to pay 1,300 
we already have IPv6, but we don't have IPv4 because unfortunately, we joined late. Unfortunately, we're working in the world of scarcity. And I have to tell you, hey, you have to find $10,000. It can cost about $10,000 to have a slash 24 so you can connect to the CDNs. And the guy says, well, I cannot pay that. And what is the solution to this? Well, those of you who have been able to lease through that provider that we have around there, then this is part of the bad practices. Bad practices because we don't have RPKI. So that's the point. So if we don't do something about this, then the smaller ones will, in my country, are doomed because this will become worse and worse and we will tend to disappear. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. That uh, This panel is absolutely relevant. My congratulations to all uh, the panelists. I'm going to speak uh, as an African citizen. The, it's a continent that is maybe the least uh, interconnected. I'm trying not to get to uh, emotional about it. I, I agree with what Patara said, but the positive thing about this panel and everybody's congratulation, you are worried about the citizens in your continent regardless of transfers, whether we include the brokers in this process or not. You want to connect those that are not connected to the internet. Unfortunately, Jordi, Fridiani, uh, they, they're also part of a Afrinec, um, we have six million IPs that are not routed in our continent, but they are uh, routed in Africa, in, in Asia. Why? Well, this is what we are debating right now. When somebody says what happens in APNEC remains in APNEC, I don't agree because the technical internet that we mentioned earlier is a single one, so you can't cover the sun with uh, your finger because the internet that today, including the brokers in the process or not, as Douglas said, uh, making mistakes or not, that's one. But are we going to leave this legacy for our children, the children of our children, and so on? So let me summarize. Patara is right because the IPs that are not assigned to a service and that are routed in Asia should be routed in Africa, but that didn't happen. So as Africa is the continent that has the lowest uh, uh, level of connections and uh, the population that is cre increasing, that is growing more. There are many businesses that won't be able to use IP before. And in five, ten years' time, we're going to, in, in Africa, we're going to be facing that problem. I'm a passive member of uh, the uh, list of LACNIC in this region. I'm uh, the, a passive uh, um, member of the list of. Uh, uh, APNIC, but I see that they're wrong. The internet is only one, and you can't delete. We we have the we our relations of Angola with Cuba or the uh, or Africa with Latin America. That's huge, and the results can be looked for in the internet with or without IPv4. Good morning. I'm uh, Eva Morales from Guatemala, and I just asked a broker to see the price of leased uh, IPs, $100, and if you buy them, 11300 Why should we add a burden to someone who's buying something by for $11,000? If they're going to install IPv6, they're going to buy something that they're going to throw away. They're going to uh, spend uh, $11,000 just uh, for uh, for six months. So what what if they lease them? We are increasing the economic burden to the small ISPs, and we are closing the uh, uh, the market because the internet is commercial. We continue 
to play, whether it's it's right, whether it's uh, technically or academically correct. But uh, the internet means business. In Guatemala, there's a company that uses the red color. They have 1.5 million IPs. But if the big ones need IPs, and they have the resources to invest in that because they are quasi-monopolies. Why are we perpetuating those monopolies, closing opportunities to the small ones to enter a market that is commercial? So let's no longer say that the internet is... Uh, I've been talking about IPv6 since 1996, but it still holds true that the day hasn't reached for the switch. And until that happens, until we all switch to IPv6, we'll have to live with IPv4. We can't close or perpetuate the monopolies of the green, of, of the, the blue, the red, the monopolies of the big ones. Hello? Good morning, everyone. I'm of the Academic Network of Mexico. My comment is uh, about what has been done in Mexico. It's true that there's a need in all senses. And from Mexico, from the Academic Network, we have put some resources in transfer because of lack of economic resources. So if we have some precious IPs and we put them in transfer because we needed the money. But also with the universities, we have discussed this so that they may see this existing reality and what they can do about it. Because honestly, the economic part, we all know that there, we don't have the economic support for this area. So if the institutions have some legacy resources, they uh, can uh, um, be, uh, they can do it as long as they can see with the broker the issues of the security that they need. And in that sense, Mexico is moving forward. The institutions need it and the academia too. And in the IXP, for instance, well, we require IPv4 addresses. And so it's also a need for the universities. So that's what I wanted to say, just to put on the table what's going on in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Silvia. Carlos? Thank you, Hernán. There's a question by Jorge González. It's a question and not a comment. Louder? I'm reading a question online. It's a question. Jorge González again asks, asks you, what happens technically with an ISP that already has an, I, an ASN and uh, uh, leases IPv4? Does this mean hijacking when they announce that block? They're repeating the question in Portuguese. My apologies. What does it imply? RPKI, ROA, that's it. Jordi, a couple of things. I've, I, I missed one earlier, and the other one they mentioned here. There's an, uh, uh, an RFC is, uh, uh, that says that in an IXP they can use private addresses that they can use the IXP through IPv6. That is something that we already mentioned that was a policy proposed a year ago. That's one thing. Then we have, effectively, I agree, and the colleague that uh, of Mexico, of uh, the academic network said it, that we have to try to make the networks profitable, and that's good, but if the, so that in, in that case, you can use uh, the, the addresses for transfers or for leasing. I see no difference. And the other, on the other hand, what the colleague of Guatemala said, I think that we need to better understand the transition, how it works. For many, many years, nobody knows how many. It might be just four or five or maybe 15. We are going to need 
a small pool of IPv4 addresses regardless your transition to IPv6. What that means is that it's not right to say that it's easier to pay $600 for leasing it for six months because actually you would have to lease it for 5, 10, 15 years. So it's obvious that it's more profitable to buy it through a transfer, uh, buy the rights uh, of a transfer than using the leasing. It's just a matter of numbers, uh, figures. So we can't say that really leasing is any better or worse from a financial standpoint than a transfer. In the end, it all depends on the uh, terms and the, the, the time. So it's, it's like, well, would you rather buy or, or rent a house if you're going to only live there for one year? Uh, Maria of Telefonica, do you have the information of what is the percentage of return of IPs to LACNIC or who among the IP holders are ready to release them for transfers? And I think it's important to regularize, to uh, give to reassure people, to uh, ensure security, transparency for the people who want to buy IPv4. I don't know whether I can answer here or the staff of LACNIC will do that. Thank you, Alfredo. Alfredo Borderosa, LACNIC service manager. Actually, the returns are marginal. So far, we haven't had any, but we usually receive the um, there are revocations one from one to two, three thousand per, per month, and uh, the very few returns. Eduardo of Lima, I have a question for Salvador. What have been the most frequent challenges between the IX PS and Lima since now? The provinces are getting more densely populated. And what's the long-term vision that you have to continue to be interconnected? If new players want to join new small ISPs that need more resources or access to your caches. Well, not just an IPv4. We always try to decentralize the internet. We try to develop ecosystems so that if the ISPs, because of transportation issues, cannot reach Lima or even just for the sake of a shorter latency, just local ecosystems will develop in the different cities of Latin America. So if you can improve one millisecond, the IXPs play a considerable role. I think that the if the IXPs don't have access to get uh, IP, uh, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to uh, compete under equal conditions. Thank you, Ricardo. Very quickly, I wanted to add a comment to what I said earlier. Uh, the truth is that I am not ignoring that IPv4 is necessary, so I understand uh, the needs that you have manifested, but from the philosophical point of view, I really oppose to it. Uh, and I have several comments, but let me summarize. A lot was said about the need for leasing because that will result in a drop in prices. Well, actually, the cost of transactions. But personally, I disagree. When we were talking about the transfer of IPv4 without uh, merge or without uh, buying, well, we said, well, we will permit the transfer because it will be cheaper. But that didn't happen. I think that the cost will only drop when IPv4 no longer has value. And that can be done only through IPv6. We are already seeing several presentations that are very correct about the need of IPv4. And we are looking, we see the leasing of IPv4 as a, as a 
uh, possibility. But uh, there, a time, the time will come when there will be no more IPB4 for leasing. So th- we should have started a definitive solution. We should have started it earlier. I know that you have very good intentions, but the time will come when the, we, we will run out of any IPB4 to, for leasing. And Douglas made some very interesting comments. But let me um, state that I disagree because we can't ignore that there are people that want to um, do uh, the, a wrongful use uh, of IPv4. So you can't put everything, everybody in the same bag. And it was very clear in the panel that uh, it, in the end, uh, money matters. So the people have a uh, bad intentions and they want to do it, they would do it. Maybe not through the brokers, but in other ways. So setting rule, restrictive rules will be good. But will they be respected? Because today there are no rules, but there are already uh, players that do things subreptitiously. And we consider that if there are restrictions, those uh, players won't continue to operate. Of course, yes, I understand the need. But from a philosophical point of view, I'm against leasing because it is not uh, a long-term solution. We need a long-term solution. So very rapidly. Just to answer, I admire you, Patara, but regarding this point, what I'd like to say is that I'm a dreamer, and I think that the future of what we're discussing here has to do with two things. One has to do with the policy of the public policy forum, and one is the policy of the board. To adjust the policy public forum adequately, and in the board, we also have a scenario, and it might be like a dream. It might seem as if there's something that we cannot touch. This is a directory. If someone complies with this adequately, there will be a cost reduction in their annual fee. So that is a path forward. And why is it so? This is because money can make this. And this is the most sensitive part. It makes the world go round. So if you do this correctly, you'll be compensated for this. And if we'll do this in the wrong way, well, there won't be others, any solution. I'm Wesley Correa once again. And this is a great discussion to listen to the members of the community. It makes me feel so proud. This is a healthy discussion. Now, I think what many of you haven't realized is that leasing takes place even if there is no regulation. And when we started considering and discussing the possibility of this being part of the policy manual for using the IP resources of the community or the number of resources of the community, this leads to the fact that LACNIC can demonstrate that there is a need of rent requesting or leasing a block. So it's LACNIC could try to deal with this in the same way as an initial request. So if you already have a slash 20 or a slash 19 or a slash 22, what is your real need to lease a new block? So we are here trying to discuss these, the top, this topic of leasing because of the new members who don't have anything at all. So this obviously is it's quite clear and those who like to write policies maybe you can write a policy on this topic because LACNIC has a possibility at present LACNIC does this already LACNIC manages these leases so one can directly lease this to another with the involvement of LACNIC so that on the receiver side this is documented and it is part of the civil and criminal uh, compliance and also complying with the technical requirements that were mentioned previously. Just in case, after the last speaker who is queuing up, we will be closing. Hernan, we have time. We'll have time for final comments. Well, I would say that we don't. I would like to ask a question. You have 10 seconds. Sorry, sorry. I'm from Chile. So there is an aphorism that says 
The question is, if you can transfer IPs, transfer IPs, why can't we lease IPs if you can make profit with an IP transfer this, transferring it? Why cannot you lease these? You cannot transfer this if you don't have the ownership. So this would lead to an immense discussion. Let's leave this. Let's leave this for another session. Let's give the floor to the speaker on the microphone. I'm Nal Camacho from Venezuela. My participation here is to ask LACNIC for the possibility of, as a new ISP in the market, to give the opportunity to those states or countries that don't have so many resources to have the option of leasing public IPs because we find it difficult to deliver to the end users a good IP. In our country, we have quite a lot of limitations. The idea is to create a project that will allow those who practically don't have anything to have the opportunity of leasing without such a high cost, so making the cost cheaper for us. So I will close the session. We have been, we have passed the time. Let me mention two or three points that were raised. The first thing, well, Jordi said five years in organizing this in the APNIC panel. And I think this is very interesting. It might seem as if here, this discussion is only starting. It started to become rather heated towards the end. But what we have to do is to continue having these conversations. There's no right or wrong position here. We'll be discussing a policy in the public policy forum in a while. And I insist once again, it's not about something being right or wrong. This dialogue will then lead us to figure out a solution in the short, medium, or even long term. So what we cannot do is stop having this conversation. So I really welcome having had this panel, and I welcome the privilege of having had the opportunity to chair this panel. So I encourage you to continue discussing this so that we can reach a consensus. Having different positions is not bad. Practically, in, in other words, it's what really enriches the final outcome. So thank you very much to the members of the panel, and thank you, LACNIC, for this space. We'll now continue with the public forum. Uh, Thank you very much, Arman, and the members of the panel. This was a tremendously interesting discussion. We'll now have a break, and the presentation we have by Kim Davis, who accepted to this right after the break. What I would like to ask you is to resume as it.